Okay, good morning. Uh, today we're going to be looking at chapter one in this book, Automotive Diesel Technology. And we're going to be covering chapter one. We're going to be using the PowerPoint per, uh, provided by Pearson. And it's not a great PowerPoint, but we'll just use it kind of as our talking point. And so if you have your book with you, you're going to want to kind of follow through with what we're doing. And so as I read through this book, this is a new book for me, and as I'm reading through the book, chapter one is just packed full of really good information. Just amazing amount of, of information. And really what I, as a person who's been working on diesels for a long time, what I really got out of it is how much change has taken place just in the last six, seven years with the changes in emissions that have come down the line that are still taking place that are continuing to take place there has been a massive amount of changing in the diesel world in the last seven eight years and it's changed pretty rapidly so those things that used to be pretty tried and true all all indirect injections are like this and all direct injections are like this and you had some pretty firm rules now they've blended it so much that the world of compact diesels has changed dramatically. And so there are very few hard, true rules that are out there. And so there's been a lot of change. So what you have to know dramatically increased just in the last couple of years. And if you think that what you learn right now is everything you need to know, that's not true. It's going to change again dramatically in the next five years. So you need to be abreast. You need to be keeping a track of it. You need to follow what changes are taking place in the compact diesel world. It will continue to rapidly change with the emission standards that are continuing to come. So we're, we're not done changing and we're definitely not to the point where diesels are perfect but man they have dramatically improved so why diesels why why did we go to diesel why do we have so many diesel engines in this industry why has the world gone so heavily to diesel and when you're reading your book and they kind of get into their introduction when you see that diesels are 25 to 60 percent more efficient than a gas engine that one single thing is a good reason why we have gone to diesel engines. So that improvement, that uh, greater efficiency is a big reason why we are using diesel engines. The economy, we talked about that. Long service life, because they are built so heavy, their service life is much longer. They last longer. Their longevity, their resale value is a lot higher. And so if you can afford the initial investment, long term you are actually going to save money so it's one of those if you have the money you can save money so that's the thing with diesel engines their maintenance cost is down we don't have spark plugs we don't have the in the old older systems where we had carburations you didn't have all the problems that come with carburation there's just a whole laundry list of problems with carburations <clears throat> Older than that, we used to have distributors with points. We got rid of points, we don't have those in diesel. When they got rid of points and went to electronic ignition, we still had distributor caps, and we still had a rotor. That was still a maintenance thing. We still had spark plug wires. And if, over time, our, our ignition systems have evolved, and we've eliminated some of those high maintenance problems that have been plaguing the, the automotive or the the gasoline world and all that we do. And so those things have never been part of the maintenance of a diesel engine. So other than changing oil, keeping your air filter serviced appropriately, I mean, there wasn't a lot of maintenance to a diesel engine. So the big thing was not letting dirt get into it and destroy it and you're good to go. <clears throat> so change the fuel filter, change the air filter, change the oil filter, change the oil, you're back on the road. Those were simple. Gasoline had a lot of stuff that you would do. So the maintenance was a lot less. Today, jump up in 2016, we still have those same 
maintenance things with a diesel engine but now with the new tier 4 emission standards and we have stuff to do with the after treatment we've kind of added into some of the things that we got to do and we're going to be getting into that later not in this chapter but those after treatment systems that are out there technically are not adding a lot of maintenance to us unless you drive them inappropriately and what we'll be talking about there is what you do driving in a diesel engine that prevents it from having those maintenance problems so again even with the new tier 4 emissions our, our standards are our maintenance hasn't changed we're still fairly simplistic as far as maintenance costs and then high torque output diesel engines produce a whole lot more torque output at a lower rpm than a gas engine and we'll be seeing that as we go through this chapter and so a diesel at a lower rpm provides a lot more usable energy than a gasoline engine so there's just a tremendous amount of advantages to a diesel engine so much so that it, it doesn't hardly make sense to have a gas engine in a lot of applications except when you get into really small handheld products things we got to carry them around then the weight of a diesel engine is definitely not advantageous so we I mean, there will be some disadvantages so they get into the development how did diesel engines come about and the other book that we talked about the other day the blue book that we'll probably go to in the future they have like five or six pages on the development of diesel engines where did they come from how did they develop kind of some of the problems they really get into a lot more detail than this book this book's pretty simplistic if you want to go forward let's go I think it's two slides go to the next one right there Whoop, back up so in your book they show you this picture this is the original first diesel engine created by Rudolf Diesel and that name Rudolf Diesel is something that you're going to want to keep track of there's another name that's in your book that talks about the auto cycle Otto Mr. Otto created or developed or dreamed up the whole cycle the four stroke cycle that we use today was developed by Mr. Otto and uh, that terminology those are things that as you're reading through you look at the auto cycle there's names when we get into injector systems there's names that we use in the injector systems then they're named after the people that invented them and so that you're familiar with them Robert Bosch created Bosch and so that name's been around Mr. Cummins the whole Cummins engines that you're familiar with today that came from the name of the guy that came up with Cummins Engines Company and so those names hopefully as you look into some of this history you can kind of see where these names that you see out there in the diesel fuel world where did they come from those are actual people who invented amazing inventions that we use today hundred years later so those are nice things so we'll back up two slides so pay attention to those names that are out there you can imagine we go from that huge tall 10 foot tall diesel engine that probably was only I don't know, not very high horsepower is pretty low and then today we got this engine that's probably three or four times as much horsepower as that thing and that thing is 10 feet tall <laughs> so it's amazing how we've shrank it down and made it so much more efficient so it's still today even in comparing it to gas engines of today in 2016 diesel engines are still the most efficient engine that's out there diesel is way more efficient than propane or gasoline and so it's still the most efficient the diesel engine runs and draws only in air there is no spark there's no spark plug and the biggest difference between a gas engine and a diesel engine is a, is a gasoline engine takes a spark plug it takes a spark to ignite it all the timing is done by the spark plug when the spark plug fires that's when the ignition point begins and it all starts at a single point and the flame will grow from there it's not an explosion 
it's a rapid burn and the flame burns across and expands and pushes the piston down. In a diesel engine, we're just compressing air. If you don't turn the fuel on, it just becomes an air pump. It's just an air compressor. That's all it is. And so if we add fuel, so we have an injector that injects fuel in, piston comes up on compression stroke. When air is heated or when air is compressed, it becomes superheated. We throw fuel in, it will ignite and it will burn. And that's what's going to happen is we, we fire a diesel engine by heat of compression. Timing is done by the injector and when it actually puts the fuel in there. And in the old days, it was simply when it got to a certain point, we injected fuel. One simple, basic process. Today, it's really complicated. We have computers. We may have up to six injections in that same time that we had one injection before. So it's amazing how technology is just rapidly beating us up. So go forward a slide. <clears throat> so the old days we had a camshaft, some sort of camshaft that pushed on a lobe or some kind of a plunger that pushed fuel, went down a fuel line, injected fuel on top of the piston. So either this style, which is a direct injection, injected it in, we shoot it across, or indirect injection, which is a little cavity off to the side, and then the flame would come out. Either way, it was a very basic, simple system that was mechanical. And the timing was done just like you would do on a distributor on a gasoline engine. You would adjust the timing to begin the point of injection. That point of injection is when fuel begins to pour into this cavity. And depending on the temperature and all the stuff that was involved in it, some point very near to that point we start the, the ignition process and we begin burning this superheated air that's in there is going to be what will actually ignite it go ahead and click on it so the fuel itself is going to absorb that heat and that's what's going to vaporize it breaks it up like anything else fuel itself diesel itself doesn't burn it's vapor that burns. So same as in gas engines, if we were to put droplets of gas in there, it doesn't burn. It has to vaporize the outer part of the droplet. If that begins to burn as it gets hotter, vaporizes it more, burns more. But if you have raw gas and you drop a match in it, it goes out. If you drop it into a can of gas, it's the vapors on top of the gas that will actually ignite. In a diesel engine, you take a can of diesel and you drop it because there's almost no vapors. It just falls through the vapor and it puts your match out. And so same thing happens. We've got to vaporize it. As that piston comes up, compresses that, that tremendous amount of heat is created. As I throw fuel in there, I want to break it up as much as possible with the injector. And then it actually continues to vaporize as it's swirling. And it's that vapor that's going to ignite and take off and burning. So you guys have read the history on his first invention where he got it from. He was in Africa and they were taking grass and putting it in, plunging it and igniting the grass. That's where he kind of got the idea, the concept. He came back and used coal dust. He put coal dust into a cylinder, took a plunger and slammed it down until it ignited and tried to utilize it. it didn't work very well. You can imagine you're thinking, wow, why would you even try to do something like that? And that's because we're looking at what's working for us and thinking, wow, that was a dumb idea. But it was the beginning point. They had no concept like we have. And so then he took the auto cycle. So he was studying the idle cycle when he was in college. He studied that, went back, combined the two thought processes, and created the diesel engine. His first fuel source was what? Cold up cycle diesel. For this engine here, his first working engine that he had, what was the fuel source? wasn't coal dust. This one here, he started getting one that actually kept working, kept running. Peanut oil? P 
peanut oil. So it was biofuel, but it was peanut oil. So we didn't have diesel fuel back then. I mean, we think of, hey, we've always had diesel fuel. Well, no, they had to actually create diesel fuel. Had to extract it, kind of culture it, make it work. So his first fuel source was peanut oil. So he had the first biofuel engine. So he still had problems, biofuel, peanut oil has problems. There's a lot of issues that took place. His machine was really big. You can see it takes up a lot of space. So if you read the other book and kind of get into the history, he worked through a lot of these problems. He had problems throughout the time that he was there. Rudolf Diesel actually was on a boat traveling across the ocean and didn't land in the port on the other side. So somewhere in his travels across this ocean that he was traveling in, he fell off the boat. So there's speculation whether he was thrown off the boat, there were speculations where he jumped off the boat. The reality is he was on the boat, he didn't make it across the ocean. So that's where he ended his life was in the ocean. And so, and he was one of those people that was a real hard-nosed type person. He was real adamant, he started out very rich, and he ended up broke because he refused to change his concept and, and make some alterations to it. And his stubbornness kind of led to his decline in wealth, let's put it that way. So, but brilliant man who came up with some pretty amazing ideas that other people took and moved forward. So his concept did take off and they used it in the large boats ocean going things where the speed was real slow. It was real easy to actually put the product in, lots of product, and actually get it to be very efficient, very thermally efficient. His biggest thing that he was working on was trying to get something that was 100% efficient. Well, it's pretty hard to be 100% efficient. And his first working model, I believe, was 70% efficient. Well, you go from steam that was like 5 to 12 percent efficient to something that was 70 percent efficient. That's a pretty amazing leap of technology. And so they were able to use it for many years in big huge applications, slow moving applications. When I was in college we had a boat motor that came out of a, a pretty good sized boat, like a large boat. And this block was about 12 or 15 feet long, and it was about 10 feet tall. And that was the block. No head, no pan, the block it was taller than I could reach. And the pistons were two feet across. And the maximum RPM of that engine was 600 RPMs. And so when you get into these gigantic engines, they go really slow but the force and the energy that they produce is just tremendous. So their thermal efficiency is tremendous. And they just pour fuel in that just stuff burns and just keeps pushing. And the energy that it produces is just unbelievable. And so his engine was along those lines of a very slow RPM, low RPM, tremendous efficiency, draw a lot of that energy out and actually put it into usable form. So that's where it started. So moving forward, let's click the arrow. We're gonna have to change the battery then. So go ahead and stop it.